Hello and welcome back to Channel 11. I've got a special guest today, Jeffrey Gunlock, CEO, CIO of DoubleLine and my mentor in the business. Thanks for joining us. We're almost through the year in early November here and it's been quite a year. What was the most surprising thing for you in 2023? Uh, a couple of things. I think the first is certainly expected a reversal of 2022 early in the year. Rates would come down, stocks would go up. And I thought it would last maybe until about April but it just kept going. Uh, not, not the rates, the rates uh, only rallied in the first, I don't know, six weeks it felt like. But then the S&P uh, kept going and the NASDAQ, well, the Magnificent Seven yep. really uh, powered the market in a way that I thought was kind of eerily reminiscent of 1999 where you had the NASDAQ go up 80% in the fourth quarter right before, you know, actually if you had sold September 30th, You've been, been pretty unhappy in the fourth quarter, but a few months later, you could have bought them back down 50%. So it was kind of, and I, I guess uh, most macro thinkers, and to a certain extent, I would say I'm part of this too, didn't fully appreciate how much service uh, momentum in terms of consumer spending. You know, we all knew that uh, with all the government money in 2020 and 2021, that there was a lot of goods buying, a lot of patio furniture, a lot of home office stuff. But uh, services uh, were non-existent because people couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. And so it was kind of surprising that services kicked in to the extent that they did. And I, I guess I was a little bit underestimated people's foolishness of uh, s putting their continued spending on very high interest rate credit cards. And I think that's what kept things going. The, the second thing, that surprised me, and I continue to be surprised by this. In fact, this week, it's become even more surprising, is with major conflict in you know, Europe with Ukraine and Russia and with uh, the Middle East, oil is down. Yep. <laughs> you know, the Western Texas Intermediate, West Texas Intermediate uh, spiked in a Pavlovian fashion when the turmoil broke out in the Middle East to the, the mid-low 90s. And today it's right around 77 or so, which is kind of surprising when you have uh, this type of potential serious uh, disruptions that could happen in a context of our strategic petroleum reserve is at the lowest level in forever. And it hasn't, yeah. it hasn't been refilled at all. So those are, those are things that sort of surprise me. Um, I guess oil could be sniffing out the slowing global growth that could be coming. Yeah, I think that's right. I, I think uh, particularly it's been Europe has been problematic. Germany has been a debacle. And uh, I think that's right. I, th I think that the commodity price complex uh, just can't really get above its 200-day moving average. And sometimes oil goes up, but the agricultural commodities go down and then oil goes down and some other things. But on a, on a total index basis, using the Bloomberg Commodity Index, it just keeps, the 200-day moving average just keeps dropping. So we, we've been uh, really neutral to negative on commodities broadly since, I, I think it was either the fall of 2020 or the fall of 2021. Those two years somehow blend Blend, together yeah. in my mind. There's such, such strange circumstances. Well, we're towards the end of the year. This is usually when Byron Wien, who just passed away, and uh, in memory of him, I thought we'd uh, try to uh, do the what should we expect in 24 that people don't expect. Well, I continue to give a, a Byron Wien uh, did that, was it 10 or 12 things? I think it was 10 uh, every year at year end. And his, his way he framed it is he said, these are things that most people give a 30% or lower probability to, and I think it's probably more like 50%. So he wasn't really making crazy bold predictions. He was just saying, I think people might be Underestimate. incrementally yeah. surprised. And I continue to believe that the presidential election is going to be very different than Trump versus Biden. Which is what the polls are coming in with right Which is now, what right? everyone, everyone has believed. I've been saying really since about 2018 that I thought the 2024 election just might go to the House of Representatives. You might actually have three candidates. And that's not at all in prospect clearly at this point, but you've got RFK Jr., you've got this no labels group, yep. and I just believe very strongly that Joe Biden is not gonna run. Uh, it just doesn't even seem possible at this point with, with the, uh, I mean, he's got us into two wars, he's drained the strategic <laughs> reserve, everything he's sort of predicted has, has not come true, 
and yet he's maintaining in his public comments that everything is just better than it's ever been. And uh, certainly people don't believe that when you look at the, the, the approval ratings and what people think about the direction of the country, which is really Jimmy Carter-esque. Yeah. And I, I said when Biden came into office in 2021, I, I, I said the policies that he's running remind me a lot of my childhood, what was going on in the 70s uh, into basically uh, uh, the election of Ronald Reagan. So I think that's going to be a big surprise. I also think there's a potential surprise, which uh, is, I'm a little uh, iffy on this, but I think that the economy is certainly softening and uh, true to form, interest rates will probably fall when, uh, if, when the recession seems to really be here. And I think that's gonna come in 2024. And interest rates will probably fall in that sort of automatic Pavlovian sense. But I'm wondering if they won't rise after the initial Pavlovian decline because of what I've been talking about. And I don't know if it's because of me or because everybody uh, tends to, in a strange way, start to wake up to things simultaneously. Yeah. But I think that it's clear that people are starting to really understand the interest extent, expense problem in the United States, what we're looking at in the next recession yeah. and, uh, and what, what the response will be because everyone's starting to realize that we have sort of institutionalized $2 trillion-ish budget deficits, even when the economy is supposedly growing well. I mean, the, the third quarter was supposedly pretty good. Fourth quarter, I mean, the estimates aren't like the third quarter, but they're not negative. Yep. And so people say, wow, nominal GDP grew in excess of 6% on an annualized basis in the third quarter. Well, that's great, except for the budget deficit is over 6% of GDP. So if we actually did the right thing, which is to have a zero budget deficit, and we should start doing that today. I gave a talk, it was, it was a, on Yahoo Finance, it was a, one of these things that was on uh, Zoom or Teams or whatever, and so I, I didn't have any connection to the audience, I just had this fellow interviewing me, and I said this, that we should have a zero deficit, and he told me that the room erupted in applause. <laughs> I, I wasn't able to hear it, yeah. but it was sort of surprising. I, I guess they were a sympathetic audience. But um, I think Yahoo Finance appeals to a younger crowd. And I think, I think people over the age of X, and I think X is probably 65 or something, they truly believe that it's still 1960. They, you know, you have, you have these, these phrases, we're the United States of America, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Yeah. Well, yeah, but what we're, what we're so-called investing in, this, these are the new buzzwords, investing and work. You know, politicians love to say they're doing work because it actually sounds like they're doing something other than, you know, trying to get more votes. Just, 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 just yeah, just, just bickering, you know. But now it's called investment. I don't think our backing of Ukraine's armaments is an investment. An investment is something that you get a return on. Yeah. What we're doing is blowing up bombs and then building more of them and uh, appropriating more and more money that we don't have to do this. So what we're calling investments are not investments. They're, they're just uh, squandering of money. I was listening to a podcast, uh, one that I listen to rather frequently because I'm sympathetic to the host. And he said he, was, he made his um, income tax payment, which I, I made it on October, I think it was 15th or 16th we had mm -hmm. to make it. Then they announced at three o'clock in the afternoon they were delaying it until yeah. November. I'd already, I'd already I paid on Friday. It was I, I paid it on Saturday, <laughs> and he said, "When I was making the payment, it was it was you know it's it's always it's always painful to do it." He said, "I was thinking, you know, I was watching TV. I had the TV on, and they were talking about more money for these wars." And he said, "Why am I even paying these taxes? Yeah, because you know I, I pay many I pay a huge amount of taxes, and I feel like it's just going to Ukraine. Yeah, and so why bother? And we have a two trillion dollar budget deficit." And you know the, official, the the real budget's about seven trillion, so we're, we're actually about twenty eight percent of the actual uh, deficit uh, budget is deficit. Why not just make it all deficit? Just forget about it. And uh, the, back at, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, there was a funny, I think it was meant to be facetious, but someone was carrying a sign that said, "Why why pay taxes when they can just print money?" And weirdly, that was um, increasingly prescient. prescient. Yeah. yeah. Well, going, we're almost going into next year, and everyone's been uh, enjoying the 5.5% T-bill. 
What is your kind of favorite, and I don't want to say trade because there, it's, you know, we like to think of things more holistically. Like right, what, what, right. What's your favorite kind of investment setup going into next year? A lot of people uh, like the phrase T-bill and chill, and it's amazing how the six-month T-bill has been at 550. Um, it was lower than that for a while when there was stresses to the regional banking system, but it was at 550 back in the early March. Yep. And it's still at 550 in spite of all the volatility that we've had uh, at the long end or at the, in the belly of the curve. But I don't really like the T-bill and chill thing because I think that uh, when and if we go into recession, that you're going to have the typical pattern that the Fed, I always say they take the stairs up and the elevator mm -hmm. down. And you know when you see the history of Fed funds, it really is a staircase. Yep. It goes up just like a staircase. Sometimes it's steeper, but it's, uh, it tends to be with uh, risers like that. And uh, I, I think I'm quite sure that when the recession comes, the Fed is going to cut rates. And they won't cut rates by what the bond market thinks, which is about 50 to 75 basis points, depending what day you look at the shape of the yield curve. I, I think that's the one thing that's not going to happen. I think that if it's going to fall, it's going to fall a couple hundred basis mm -hmm. points. And you're going to reinvest your 550 at, who knows, 350, three. So I like something more like three-year investments, two to three-year investments. And I don't really want to get very down in credit. Uh, for the past couple of years, my favorite investment was bank loans because I knew the Fed was going to have to hike rates. Mm -hmm. And rates were uh, punishingly low. <clears throat> so at least you could participate with higher income. But the benefit of the bank loans, and they've certainly been uh, among the best performers for the past couple of years, the benefit of getting that higher coupon starts to turn into kind of a worry. Yep. Will the company be able to pay it? And it's one thing for a company to go from four to 10, and uh, they can survive for a while. But what if it stays there uh, with today's phrase, higher for longer? Yeah. Every day, it becomes more painful. So I'd be more interested in things that are more like in the double B category, maybe, maybe some parts of single B. I like structured products a lot because they, they're, they're abundant to that part of the curve. Yeah. So you can mix together quite short-term securities, one year and under, in CMBS markets, and I'm not, not talking about you know urban office space. I'm talking yeah. about the 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 uh, CMBS market is really a market of sectors. It's a sector of sectors, I guess I would say. But there's parts of it where you can get very high sleep at night factor with about a one or two year life and yields of about seven and a half percent, and there won't be any defaults. Uh, we're quite quite sure of that. And then you can mix together some some other credit. That might be double B bank loans, I think are still okay because unlikely to take significant defaults there. And then uh, increasingly, I'm starting to take a look at emerging markets. We have been, uh, correctly as it turns out, uh, quite negative on emerging markets for the past, I don't know, 18 months, even though the valuation has been good mm -hmm. uh, and the dollar hasn't really been st strengthening. The head of our team, Luz Padilla, who's had been very, very good these past few years. She's been negative on the sector, uh, not massive, not maximum negative, but incrementally wants to be underweight and not marginally underweight. But I think next year, when the recession comes, the dollar is going to weaken. So I'm looking for the tr trading point to get into that. But when you wrap it all together, there are, you can get mixes of this type of credit where you're, quite, you're diversified, although you're all, you're all in credit, but you're not all in one sector of credit. You can get together, put together about a three-year portfolio with a yield that's nearly seven and a half. And I think that that is just really an easy thing to own. Yeah. It's 200 basis points more than the T-bill. It's sort of locked in, if you want to call it that, but not in an in a uncomfortably long-term period. And then you can match that with some treasuries because the credit does have downside. Uh, but you can have some treasuries and you can get 5% pretty easily. I think the, the five-year treasury is at 5%. Uh, you can get uh, and you mix that together and you can get something that looks very uh, well paired to uh, handle volatility of interest rates, volatility of uh, credit risk, and still get something that I believe will outperform most non-fixed income investments. Yeah. What do you think uh, people should be avoiding? Or triple C underweight. bank loans, <laughs> triple C bank loans, which I think I don't know. I don't even look at them anymore. Yeah. But I think if you just look at the stated yield, I think it's like 19 or something. Well, that's that's obviously because there's going to be defaults. And one thing that I've been noodling around with, and I think this is really important, and I think increasingly investors will start understanding 
how powerful this idea is, that everybody thinks that they know how interest rate relationships and economic relationships work because they've been around a long time and they've seen a number of cycles. So I've been around 40 years, and so how many recessions have I seen? I don't even know, eight or nine. So they think they know how things work, but what a lot of people don't understand is they're, they're a summer insect, and maybe it's now we're entering the winter, and a summer insect doesn't know what winter is. Yeah. And so what I'm saying is uh, credit investors, high yield investors, investment grade corporate investors, whenever the economy got a little bit soft or very soft, uh, there's, that puts uh, st stress on the payback ability of corporations. But every time they got bailed out because interest rates would go down. And so everybody thinks they know how all this works, but maybe we're all summer insects and we're entering the winter, which, which of course is a metaphor for perhaps secularly rising interest rates. Mm -hmm. And I'm in that camp. I, I do think rates are going to fall in a Pavlovian sense when the economy weakens, but I think that they're going to go up to higher when they, where, where they are now, at least on the long end. The Fed may do quantitative easing to slow that down the way Japan has done it for such a long time. But I do think that the rates may rise at that point. So uh, re really, I, I think that that's a very important uh, thing to understand, that maybe everything that we think we know is informed of a general backdrop which is no longer in play. And I'm pretty, sh I, I have a high conviction that's the case, and we have to think about what that, how that affects investment returns. For, for, for one thing, it means that the PE on stocks is too high. Yeah. I mean, if, if rates are going to go up and the economy is going to weaken or those things happen uh, sequentially or simultaneously, what are we doing with a, P, a trailing PE that's in the 20s? Yeah, especially in these high flyers still. Right. And of course, in uh, a rollover of a market, the, the ones that lead the charge higher ultimately lead the charge lower, uh, like the NASDAQ did in, the, or in 2000 and 2001. And I think that's what's going to happen. Uh, that the, the, the rank order of, of success, well, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. I mean, you're kind of seeing a glimpse of this in the commercial real estate market that you know, it lives and exists because of debt and the ability to refinance debt because all the debt comes due every five to 10 years and, and people just cannot refi because rates are higher and the whole business model was predicated on cash flows higher than debt and it's the opposite now. And the thing about commercial a real estate market, particularly office market, is it just doesn't ever have an uptick. I mean, there was a building in San Francisco that sort of famously, it was, it was valued at $200 million. And this was after the lockdowns. They tried to sell it and they tried, and somebody bid, back bid them to, uh, to, down 20%. They bid 160 million. I saw that. And they passed. And I, I can't remember exactly what they ended up selling it for because they were sort of a four seller. It was either 20 million, 40 million, or 60 million? I think it was 60, yeah. I think it was 60. 60. So that's another, another $100 million haircut on top of the first 40. So there's just never an uptick. There's a lot of uh, black space as you look out there. My last question, I think you already answered it, was the kind of the risk people aren't thinking about. And uh, I think that's that, that longer term rising rate that- I think, uh, I think higher for longer is a really big problem. And today we had a really bad 30 year auction. It tailed seven basis points and Jay Powell was at some sort of a conference and he piled on with more hawkish rhetoric than he gave last week in his press conference where they uh, kept the Fed funds rate unchanged. And so they're really pound beating the drum about higher for longer, but they don't understand that if interest rates actually do sort of what they say, and I did this at uh, Grant's conference a month ago, I say, what if interest rates are not at five and a half across the curve, let's just round it up to six. What if the budget deficit is 9% of GDP, it's already, six to seven, and we're in a supposedly good economy. So what happens if it's not so good economy, it probably goes to nine. And what if the CBO's growth projections are actually right? So we don't even assume in the GDP, the nominal GDP, a recession. What happens is that five years from now, with 50% of the treasury debt rolling off in the next 36 months, five years from now, 50% of all tax receipts would go to interest expense. Mm, yeah. And that's not our grandchildren's problem. Back in the, when I was starting this business, everybody knew that we were doing foolish things, promising things that we couldn't pay for, but it was always gonna be a problem in 2050. And then 10 years later, so it was now it was like 1995 or so, and suddenly it was 2040. 
and then went to 2005, and it was 20. So it's it go, time's going this way, and the the problem is coming the, closer. The, the problem is getting closer, so it's actually shrinking on both sides. So now it looks like it's about five years, and the trustees of the Social Security Administration themselves acknowledge at this point that absent a recession, they're out of money in about seven years from now. So we know there's going to be a recession in the next seven years. Yeah. So it, that jives exactly with this five-year or half the money, which of course can't have, you can't have half the tax receipts go to interest expense because 70% of the budget is mandatory spending. Yeah. And now some of that probably is interest expense, but this is the interest expense taking that 70% into, you know, more like, like 100%. So there's nothing left for so-called discretionary spending. And uh, that's, a, that's just, that's a big problem with higher for longer. And we talked about bank loans and other floating rate debt. Uh, and of course, leases that roll and you know, all kinds of uh, things that have to be renegotiated. So higher for longer is going to be, be a problem. Uh, and with every passing day, it gets more acute. Every passing day, the, the screws are getting tightened. And of course, if you're really looking for the labor market to weaken, which is what the Fed says that they want to do, they want to weaken by less than a percentage point on the unemployment rate. I think that's going to be hard to do once you get the momentum going. Yeah. But you know, they say they want unemployment to go up. Well, how does that happen? Well, it happens because financial firms and some tech companies are laying people off. But what they really what they really need to do, and they don't want to talk about explicitly, is they have to take out those companies in the middle that are marginal and are starting to feel the stresses of higher interest rates, and they'll ultimately have to go bankrupt. And that's going to, that's going to happen with higher for longer. And that's, in fact, that's not a consequence of higher for longer, it's the goal. Yeah. And so that's what you have to realize. And so it's, you're, you're just not thinking clearly if you think, that you can do this interest rate move that they're talking about, they've already largely accomplished, and have this just you know no landing scenario, yeah. which I think foolishly has been priced into uh, various corners of the risk market. Well, the the Powell's favorite three month tenure inverted a year ago, and uh, I think the market maybe just got a little bit impatient, waiting for the slowdown. People are too impatient in the investment business. One thing you say, I mentored you a little bit. One thing I try to tell people is. Everything, everything takes longer than you think. It, it just seems, it's almost unbearable sometimes. Yeah. When the, when the, when the interest-only mortgages and the pick-a-pay mortgages showed up starting in 2004, it was amazing that the housing market stayed together for three years because it was so ridiculously expensive from a conventional financing point of view. And frankly, that's sort of where we are today. Yeah. Well, thanks so much for your time. Appreciate having you on and good luck out there next year. 